Namaskaram everybody, Jai Shri Ram. Welcome back to the We Are Not Lonely podcast. The last podcast was something refreshingly different, wasn't it? We had a guest on, it's been a while since we had a guest on. And it took a decent amount of presence, staying present, to ensure that I didn't go on a rant as usual. But it was a nice experience. And I'm really grateful to Robin for the whole experience. Again, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. It's episode number 52. It's all about Robin's journey from Berlin to Mysore. It's a quite, it's quite the interesting journey, if I do say so myself. He's been traveling for a while and he got here in Feb. He's been here for quite a while. He's just... I think leaving India for the second time in six months now. But yeah, go check out that and get back to this whenever, right? This is part of the initial part, which is kind of unstructured, and I go off on a rant slash an unstructured spiral. (laughs) Hopefully not too negative. But yeah, the idea is that I was supposed to have this backlog of audio that I could put out at a moment's notice, but I still haven't gotten to that, unfortunately. I'll get there eventually. That's the plan. We'll get there. Also, I haven't been putting out videos for a while. There's been a bit of an issue on my end where since I didn't put a timer, a limit on when I would start putting out videos, I haven't. So I'm going to have to work on that a little better. I haven't. I've been recording. I just haven't been editing and putting things out. I've said this multiple times. Everything's okay on my end. I'm just saying that. I'm just putting it out there. I just want to be in a position where I can put out videos consistently. That's it. And I've gone through things. I've gone through the older videos and I've decided not to elongate certain videos more than it's necessary. A lot of the videos I do end up waffling. I'm going to have to study my earlier videos at the same time to see what I could do better. So I can do better. (laughs) So I've sort of ended up falling sick. I have a bit of a cough. I'm getting better, but I'm not perfect. I need to do... I need to get a lot better. I've got this weird cough. It's... Yeah... Anyway, I've been thinking about this one particular topic for a while now, and let's start by segueing into a small introduction about the topic itself. Sometime, sometime back in 2018, 2019, I guess, I started writing a bunch of things about what we could do regarding the system, capitalism, etc. It might come as a surprise to you considering the way I've been shitting on communism, but at a particular time, I was actually quite non-capitalistic. I was actually a communist. I was leading towards that direction. I used to make all the traditional standard arguments such as, oh, that wasn't real communism. By which I meant, oh, if you make me the benevolent dictator, then I'll show you what real communism looks like. Now, just putting it out there, on paper, both communism and capitalism are brilliant systems. But that's only on paper. In theory, both are ideal utopian societies. On one end, you have a benevolent government composed of perfect people doing everything in their power to uplift the downtrodden and ensuring that everybody gets paid their equal fair share. On the other side, we have a system that rewards people for the effort they've put in, for their ability. Sort of, not really egalitarian, but fair. Because you get compensated according to the effort. Whereas in communism, you get compensated no matter the effort. You're, you're all kind of equal. That's on paper. In reality, though, Things are quite different. Not everybody in a capitalistic society is going to be recognized for their talent. Maybe there's no market for their skills. 
etc etc there's a lot of criticisms of capitalism as is one being that companies can go on a rampage disregard human rights etc etc and that's actually what we're going to be talking about today because i've done a decent amount of criticism of the other form of government which is not government but an idea of statehood whatever <laughs> it's difficult to explain capitalism and communism i'm going to have to do a little more in-depth studies i'll get there but this i'm just putting it out there this is an understanding that i had of the failure of capitalism or the dark side of capitalism back in 2018 2019 i was writing a lot at that particular time i was doing a lot of research and i was writing a great deal and this is what i put together during that time and i'm i'm going to be talking about that the other thing i wanted to say is we all know how communism turned out such a brilliant system on paper but once things came out into play for example communism does necessitate the fact that you begin with a bloody revolution and that's what the communist manifesto is all about it's a call for a bloody revolution quite literally and the proletariat sees capital the sees the land etc from the bourgeoisie they take back the means of production they take back the power and then for some reason they suddenly magically become perfect people they can perform at a very high level that these people haven't been able to i don't know how that happens but that's the assumption that karl marx makes i'm going to have to study das kapital and das kapital or das kapital and the communist manifesto at some point a lot of things to do in the future <laughs> but yeah we know how communism turned out with the deaths of millions and millions of people communist china mao zedong ended up killing now this is unconfirmed because there were so many dead people that we don't even know how many died around hundreds of millions of people and around 60 million people died in the soviet union and the and the gulags etc the so communism has killed hundreds hundreds of millions of people and people still think it's a brilliant idea despite all the evidence to the contrary now i'm not saying that our system is perfect it definitely isn't but the way to move forward in my opinion in my humble opinion i'm not a statesman i'm not an economist i'm just a person who works on himself on a daily basis and tries to improve on a daily basis my opinion in my very humble opinion the best way forward at fixing the system is one step at a time you fix one one small step you have a grand vision of the future but you make small steps at a time you don't scrap away the entire thing you don't forcibly re- redistribute wealth that's not how it's done the whole idea behind taxes etc is basically redistribution of wealth and that's where the big problem is the main reason that revolution also happens is because people start to believe a critical percentage of the population start to believe that it's impossible to be fairly compensated that their efforts are not being worth their efforts are not being valued properly they're not being remunerated properly and that there's a huge gap between the rich and the poor and once that happens bloody revolution happens and that's what's happened over the years for a very long time across empires etc etc but today it's not about all that it's going to be about 25 year old me figuring out the world this is literally a blast from the past i i'm going through my notes talking about the things i've done i mean i've studied in the past certain companies criticism of criticism of certain companies and that's going to make a huge part of this okay <coughs> 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 I'm going to have to get some medicine huh All right <clears throat> The notes begin 
clearly the world isn't quite as black and white as we all think it is. It should be easy to clarify the difference between the two and classify certain companies as downright evil. But we should remember that companies were created solely for the relentless pursuit of profit. I mean, we do have a vision and a mission and all of that, but that's only possible if we're able to put out money, if we're able to churn out enough money on a yearly, monthly, weekly basis, etc. There is this idea of corporate social responsibility that's growing all around the world. And companies have started to sort of contribute more to society, more than just what they did previously. They have these ideas of adopting green parks. There are certain companies that pursue things that, that are not really for profit, that just boost the company's name. For example, in my show, there's this lake, the Hebal Lake, that is maintained by Infosys. It's not really something that they're doing for profit. They're doing something for the environment because they have the money and they're able to do it. It's part of their CSRR, they call it. But just remember that companies do need to pursue profit. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, especially if they're a limited liability company or a public company, whatever. If they're a company that is issued stock, they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to pursue profit at the best possible manner. Now, the problem with this, this re relentless pursuit of the bottom line forces everybody to become short term. And I believe this is really brilliant book that my professors have told me about while I was studying. It's something like bad management theories are destroying good managers are uh, destroying good management practices. Okay, my mistake, it's not actually a book, it's a research paper. So I am going to have to look into that. It should be fun. So Sumantra Goshal is an Indian writer who has written this particular topic. I'm going to have to find him and ask him about it. He's appeared on the World Economic Forum, which is slightly worrying. Oh, he's he passed away. Oh man, that's unfortunate. Dear Lord, how on earth are these companies? Yeah, so this is another thing. I'm going off on, on a rant. But this idea of online journals kind of gate gatekeeping content and they don't even pay the original publisher of this particular thing, anything. That's that's something really sad. I and mean, we need to do something about it. This is one of the dark sides of capitalism. Anyway, getting back to the topic. <clears throat> I was very melodramatic, so some of the things that I write are pretty intense. Like the fact that companies remain organizations that pursue profit is kind of a commentary on the human race as a whole. Now, it's important to remember that Companies have a tremendous influence on consumer psyche with certain companies having an ad advertising budget in the billions. And most companies, like most popular companies that we know, have a turnover larger than the GDP of certain developing countries. So if I say that certain co companies can definitely influence countries, I'm not pulling things out of my bottom. You know what I'm saying? Right Now, the thing is, sometimes these practices fall in very morally gray areas. Now, this isn't something that you find in just one or two companies. I'm going to start off with one company that everybody knows about. This is mostly factual. As much as I can, to the best of my knowledge, if I have made any errors in what I've spoken about, I ask for forgiveness, all right? So let's start with Nestle. We're going to start off with its history, its current situation. Now, it's one of the world's leaders, leading brands in food and beverage. When I last studied their sales, 
they had reported sales of nearly 91.4 billion francs that's approximately 20 92.3 billion dollars or at that time it was equivalent to 6403.85 billion indian rupees an increase of nearly 2.1% from 2017 let's check its current sales Okay, so this is from Macro Trends. That's my source. Nestle. Nestle's annual revenue for 2022 was 99.32 billion dollars, an increase of 3.78 from 2021. Its revenue in 2021 was 95.7 billion, a 5.96 increase from 2020. and the annual revenue for 2020 was 9 90.321 billion dollars which was actually a decline from 2017 i don't have 2019's data just give me a second let's see i do believe so that's the situation with nestle the or a massive company almost hitting 100 billion dollars in revenue yeah among its large group of holdings they've got multiple brands such as kitkat maggi maggi noodles everybody's favorite noodles and nescafe it also has a wide range of other products including baby food bottled water coffee and tea ice cream pet foods snacks medical food breakfast cereals confectionery and dairy products Let's look a little into their history. Nestle as we know it was formed in 1905. Nestle as we know it was formed in 1905 after the merger of two companies, namely the Anglo-Swiss Condensed Milk Company which started in 1866 and Ferdinand Lacti Henry Nestle which was founded by Henry Nestle in 1866. The Anglo-Swiss Condensed Milk Company was founded by two brothers, Charles and George Page. Their first product was condensed milk under the Milk Maid brand. Now, Henry Nestle was actually a German-born pharmacist whose first breakthrough was Ferry Lact Lacti, a combination of cow's milk, wheat flour, and sugar, which was developed by Nestle for the consumption of infants who couldn't be breastfed. to try to try to sort of counter to try to combat the high rates of infant mortality now this was around the time 1867 which was also when nestle began using its iconic nest logo henry nestle would later sell his company and factory to local businessmen now initially both these companies which is the anglo swiss condensed milk company and nestle were at loggerheads they were competing companies that were selling rival versions of each other's products and like i said eventually they merged in 1905 they were also instrumental in the creation and development of the first milk chocolate i forgot who they collaborated with i haven't written it down at that particular time once the merger happened nestle as a company grew massively the first world war was instrumental in its growth and government contracts really helped Nestle's production double by the end of the war. The Second World War caused a bit of a plunge in their profits but also played a huge part in introducing Nescafe, the coffee, which was a staple drink of the US army, the U- US military. Now, after the Second World War, Nestle grew dynamically. It had increased growth and it had increased growth and thanks to that increased growth it was able to merge and acquired a bunch of other companies it merged with maggi in 1947 which was a manufacturer of soups and seasonings in 1950 they acquired cross and blackwell they acquired findis in 1963 libby's in 1971 and stufers in 1973 they also acquired a portion of the shares of l'oreal which meant that they essentially diversified their massive portfolio already in 
In 1977, they acquired another company called Alcon Laboratories. Now, this massive mergers and acquisitions improved their bottom line drastically and they were able to acquire bigger and bigger companies during the 1980s. For example, they ended up acquiring Carnation for $3 billion in 1984 and they also founded Nestle Nespresso South Africa in 1986. In 1988, they acquired Roundtree Macintosh for $4.5 billion, which got them their iconic brand KitKat. Nestle has since continued with its tried and tested formulas, mergers and acquisitions. However, it's also run into a fair share of controversies over the years. Let's talk about the Nestle Infant Formula. Now, this was actually the first ever product that they came out with. Henry Nestle had started the company with this intention to provide an alternative to children who could not be breastfed. In an attempt to reduce the infant mortality rates because, you know, they weren't, be able, they weren't being breastfed and therefore they were dying. So in an attempt to avoid that, to prevent that, he came out with his formula, which was a combination of wheat, sugar, and cow milk. But there's an issue here, all right? Mostly because it was a for-profit organization that decided to pursue profits aggressively. Now, first off, everybody knows health experts around the world agree that breast milk is best for an infant, especially during the first six months of its life, after which it's necessary to add other types of food. During this time, they generally start adding milk into the baby's diet, that is cow milk. And this is probably because of the fact that cows have evolved alongside mankind for thousands of years. At least in India, it's been here at least for the past 10,000, right? Now, the issue is that Nestle chose an aggressive marketing strategy to promote its baby milk formula in underdeveloped countries, in both Africa and Latin America. It used tactics like dressing up sales girls in nurse uniforms and promoting their products in communities that could not really use them properly. And the most dangerous tactic that they used so far was the practice of giving away free samples using nurses to tell the poor that their product was superior to breast milk. Now the issue with breast milk is that if you stop feeding the child, if, if you essentially wean off the child, if they stop breastfeeding for a while. It dries up when not in use. And now, the way they had handed out these samples was they, they had planned it out. The samples, lo- they, the samples lasted just as long. You know, it, the samples lasted long enough for the mother's milk supplies to dry up. And this forced poor families to be solely dependent on the formula. Now, comparatively, compared to breast milk, which is essentially free, formula was expensive. So they would buy as much as they could and then ration out the usage of the formula. The result was malnourished babies and several deaths. Another issue is that Nestle did give out detailed instruction leaflets to the mothers regarding the strict hygiene standards that were supposed to be maintained. But most of the mothers in Africa at that time, in the African countries, were illiterate, unable to read the instructions. And the other major issue was that portable water, drinkable water, was another major problem in Africa. There was a huge shortage of portable water there. And this caused issues. Now, I just have to mention this, that even in a so-called first world country like the UK, the United Kingdom, Britain, which has much higher standards of living and families that have conditions that where families live in conditions that are much more hygienic, babies still ended up suffering from infections from the feeding bottles. Now, when this whole situation happened, there were a lot of malnourished babies, a lot of infant mortality. It caused outrage, widespread outrage around the world, especially when the news spread sparking the Boycott Nestle campaign that started in the 1970s and has lasted over seven years. It resulted in the UN, UN's World Health Assembly, 
to lay down an international code of conduct to govern the promotion and sale of breast milk substitutes, as reported by The Guardian. This particular issue is actually much larger. This is entire, there was this entire campaign that was led. There's this beautiful PDF that I will link in the thing. It's called The War on Want. The War on Want Investigation into the Promotion and Sale of Powdered Baby Milks in the Third World. The paper is called The Baby Killer. Initially, I believe uh, they had called it, they had blamed Nestle, they called Nestle the baby killer, and they were forced to change that particular situation later. It's about 12 pages, it has a great deal of information in it, I highly suggest you check it out. This report actually accused Nestle for causing illness and infant mortalities in third world countries by promoting the infant formula at the expense of breastfeeding, yeah. So this is actually the protest, the outrage that led to the boycott of Nestle products. If you look at it, <clears throat> this boycott Nestle is still going on. The boycott was so... They say that it was dropped in 1984. But there are a lot of people that say that the boycott continues. All right. This is one of the main reasons they allegedly ended up killing children. Now the other issue that I'm going to talk about is regarding water. There's this one interesting clip that was played. I'm going to try I'm going to try and find it if I can. Ja, es gibt auch ja bei uns ein, ein schönes Lied, äh, Wasser braucht das liebe Vieh, Holera und Holerie, wenn Sie sich erinnern können. Also Wasser ist natürlich das wichtigste Rohmaterial, das wir heute noch auf der Welt haben. Es geht darum, ob wir das normale Wasserversorgung äh, der Bevölkerung äh, privatisieren oder nicht. Und da gibt es zwei verschiedene äh, Anschauungen. Die eine Anschauung, extrem würde ich sagen, wird von einigen von den äh, NGOs vertreten, äh, die darauf pochen, dass Wasser zu einem äh, äh, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. Das heißt, als Mensch sollten sie einfach Recht haben, um Wasser zu haben. Das ist die eine Extremlösung. Ja? Und äh, die andere, die sagt, Wasser ist ein Lebensmittel, so wie jedes andere Lebensmittel, sollte das einen Marktwert haben. Ich persönlich glaube, es ist besser, man gibt einem Lebensmittel einen Wert, so dass wir alle bewusst sind, dass, dass das etwas kostet und dann anschließend versucht, dass man mehr spezifisch für diesen Teil der Bevölkerung, der keinen Zugang zu diesem Wasser hat, dass man dann dort etwas spezifischer eingreift und da gibt es ja verschiedene Möglichkeiten. Also. so, the video that we just watched is of the former CEO of Nestle, Peter Brebeck Lemath, who said that water should not be a universal human right. Okay? Now, Nestle has since then gone on the warpath and says that, yes, water is a human right now, but that's mostly because people say that, <clears throat> I mean, you can watch the video itself, all right, but you can see what Nestle's damage control is now. And the reason that people have labeled Nestle evil is because of their past track record, all right? Essentially. Hello, I'm Peter Prabek, the chairman of Nestle. There are apparently some misconceptions about my ideas on water. Let me make it clear from the beginning. I have always supported the human right to water. Everyone should have enough <coughs> clean, safe water to meet their fundamental daily needs. About 50 to 100 liters per day. 
but not to fill a pool or wash a car. There is a difference. We must transform the way we think about water. By 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in regions without enough water. Water scarcity is the greatest challenge we face today. And we need to start recognizing water as a precious They've resource. since then gone on. Therefore, water should be better managed, should be better valued, and has to be better preserved. If we give water value, there will be an incentive to invest in looking after our supply. You know, most of fresh water we use, up to 90% in fact, is used in agriculture. As a food producer, we depend on the long-term sustainable availability of this precious resource. In our factories, we have reduced our use of water by more than half in the last 10 years. But we are not alone. We work with others to exchange ideas and innovations and to advocate on the <coughs> importance of water. I'm glad water is top of the agenda today. It's where it should stay. And thank you for taking the time to be part of this conversation. Okay, so the first video by Brabeck ended up garnering a lot of controversy and the reason that it's not available anywhere properly is they decided to go on damage control. Okay, the original video that I tried to show you, which I found on this website called trueactivist.com, it's no longer available. It's not available for, you can't view it. And the way they've gone around and made it visible is they've made it available in another name or something like that. And that's how they've done it. <clears throat> now, I leave it up to you to figure out what he meant by his second video where he talks about, oh, we should have 100 liters per day per person for all of the activities. More than that, we shouldn't have. You shouldn't have enough to fill a pool. You shouldn't have enough to wash your car, etc., etc. The first people that should be penalized are the super rich who have multiple luxury residences around the world where they fill up their pools with a lot of water, right? He's not talking about that. That's a bit hypocritical, if I do say so myself. Now, kind of controversial, because they're talking about water. They essentially want to privatize anything more than what should be deemed allowed, the minimum required to each person. So, yeah, this guy, Peter Brabeck, mentions that water should not be free, and the rest should be charged, I assume. Of course, there was a great deal of public outrage, and which is why he had to clarify his position in the second video. They now have a separate page on their website dedicated to explaining that Peter Brabeck believes that water is a human right, and he clarifies the same thing on his blog, and they've got a video which I played just now. However, the fact remains that initially that he has said that water needs to be assigned a price, and he argues that I mean, sorry, he argues that assigning water a price, we would become a lot more aware of how precious it is. Now, they are actually one of the largest manufacturers of bottled water. And they've come under heavy fire from local communities because of their modus operandi, which is to enter vulnerable rural areas with the promise of giving them jobs. They extract all of their uh, groundwater for a paltry sum, they bottle it, sell it at a huge markup, and they make millions and billions of dollars in profits. For example, in the desert regions of California, Nestle actually bottles water, which is weird considering it's a desert area and they have water shortages. They've also been involved in a dispute in Wisconsin over the usage of pristine water sources. And they're also very unpopular in Oregon. They're accused of privatizing something that is supposed to be a basic human right. And then again, we've already seen Nestle's stance on human rights and water. 
next thing that we're going to be talking about Nestle's issues is about child slavery now a large amount of chocolate makers chocolate companies companies that make chocolate are actually found in, at the forefront of these accusations if you're a chocolate manufacturer in one way or another it's kind of linked to child labor and child slavery it's a known fact that child labor was a huge thing in cacao plantations why but large companies like nestle and others to be fair other companies or the large companies that manufacture chocolate turn a blind eye towards such practices since it drastically reduces the price of production and therefore the price that they can get cacao coco They aren't a direct owner of cacao plantations, but they are a major customer, and obviously they have massive, aggressive pricing demands, and that dictates the conditions of the plantations that they work with. Now, to meet those prices, they have to undercut in certain areas, and in ways they undercut prices by using child labor. So. the fair labor association was one of the people that accused nestle of being in violation of its own labor laws this is another issue that they've been accused of again and again and again another issue that nestle has been involved in is this practice called greenwashing the let's talk about greenwashing what it is first it's a term used to describe a corporate practice that is used to make the company seem more environmental friendly than it actually is so they're harming the environment but greenwashing it and saying no we're actually very good we're good people now this has become a thing especially in the 21st century because everybody is becoming very aware that the environment is a big talk sustainability all that greta thunberg climate change etc So it's become necessary for companies to seem like their practices are kind of environmentally conscious but they in practice it's easier to pollute and then cover up the evidence given the fact that it is cheaper to pollute and then cover up and that people have to pursue profit at all costs and that most companies especially upper level management is kind of dependent on the bottom line to show their performance it seems kind of obvious what it seems kind of obvious what exactly the company is going to choose so this was an issue in canada because they came under fire and they were actually caught greenwashing with an advertising company they claim that most water bottles avoid landfill sites and are recycled bottled water is the most environmentally responsible consumer product in the world and that's a flat out lie it actually prompted multiple environmental groups to file complaints with advertising standards because they believe that nestle could not back up the claims that they made about the recycling activities and to be fair plastic bottled water is one of the worst things that has happened but it's also incredibly convenient and this is a situation it's become industry standard to sell beverages in plastic bottles the big companies like pepsico nestle bisleri are the ones driving this they sort of <clears throat> have an entire industry and unless they start investing in other alternatives the industry standard will not change it takes big players to make big changes of course the cost of research could be done by a smaller company but let's just face it cost could be very huge you do need a lot of money to research alternatives to plastic things are happening now there's a lot of other options i think jaden had come out jaden smith had come out with this just water thing which is mainly made up of mainly made up of paper but the fact remains is that most of the world uses plastic bottles most of the big companies use plastic bottles and plastic bottles are bad very bad for the environment 
they definitely end up in lion foods okay moving on in 2015 there was this issue with maggi noodles which is which was one of my favorite things from 2012 to 2015 when i was studying in christ university it was almost a daily ritual with my acapella group to get maggi noodles before and after practice because we were hungry i would argue that we spent more time eating than practicing <laughs> that's how we actually bonded but the funny thing is almost none of us are in contact anymore but that's a life it's been 10 years since we all met 7 years since we parted ways it was 2015 8 years since we parted ways we had a good run the last embers of this entire thing came to an end around 20 22 20 yeah by the beginning of this year but let's not go into that so essentially <clears throat> essentially what happened was maggi faced a new controversy nestle's main product maggi faced a controversy when official reports from new delhi india found that 12 out of 13 samples were contaminated with lead beyond permissible levels also they were found monosodium glutamate in the flavor package it was not listed in the ingredients so nestle denied the allegations saying that its products were found free of all of the substances mentioned it did agree to cooperate with the authorities on the matter and in light of that they took immediate action they banned the sales of maggi and all products every single maggi packet was pulled from the store so i actually had like a two pack of maggi which i was posting about it probably contained lead but i was showing it off to my friends at the time now it actually bowed down to the severe pressure that they faced from multiple sources like i said they ended up withdrawing maggi completely from stores it said that the product was completely safe but since there were unfounded concerns about the product they've led to an environment of confusion for the consumer to such an extent that they have decided to withdraw the products off the shelves so for a very long time maggi was not available in india a bunch of other products came into the foray uh, for example sunfeast sunfeast itc's brand sunfeast yippy noodles it's actually a viable alternative and back when i was in hyderabad i would eat sunfeast yippy noodles this is not i'm not being sponsored by them or anything but i would eat yippy noodles at least once or twice a week along with the rest of the people at the thing i was the one who would be preparing it because i had a special secret sauce and they liked the way i prepared it but essentially the the issue was that maggi was deemed unsafe nestle denied the allegations but they decided to pull out all of the product from the market and after a very long time they actually re-entered the market but this time a bunch of other companies had propped up to sort of fill in the void that maggi left our reports say that they destroyed maggi worth 320 crore indian rupees after a bunch of months of legal battles they were actually cleared to be safe and they are currently back on shelves and they're very popular i personally don't like to eat maggi as much because when i have had maggi it's caused gastric issues on the occasion whereas when i've had sunfi cp noodles uh, no issues at all and this is something that is sort of been shall we say verified by multiple people i've experimented this on multiple people the reason that nobody in hyderabad in my small little circle eats maggi noodles is because all of us had the same issue and we decided to you know let's not buy this let's buy yippee noodles and let's stick to that itself so the controversy actually didn't just end up with maggi sorry that's a small correction that i wanted to mention at that time they caused multiple companies like indonesian to withdraw its 
noodles based top ramen it also forced hindustan unilever to ensure that they withdrew their uh, instant noodles brand which was nor so a bunch of companies had to stop selling I, i think for a very long time noodles weren't available in the market or something i'm not quite sure i don't remember it's 2015 2016 kind of blurry but i remember having one packet of maggi at that time it was there somewhere and i was like ha guys check it out maggi they were all like how let's have it together and all that nonsense it was funny yeah another issue was the chinese milk scandal so in 2008 milk based products in china came under intense scrutiny when people discovered there was something called melamine in them now this wasn't an issue just with nestle to be fair several other companies who had manufacturing activities in china came under the microscope but the reason that this happened was because it's very similar and can be mistaken for protein by using melamine in their products or uh, the dairy manufacturers in china could illegally show higher levels of protein in their milk this also helped them reduce costs apparently because melamine was quite cheap but the problem is it's severely problematic it uh, has issues since protein is an important part of the diet for children and human breast milk contains about 1.3% protein This caused severe deficiency when babies were fed with the formula and the contamination came to light after there were several cases among babies in one particular area called the Gansu province and all of them were diagnosed with kidney stones and eventually they found out the main perpetrators they were called the Sanlu group and it did bring to light the problems in China Nestle was kind of affected in this because in 2008 Taiwan banned the sale of powdered milk as well as infant formula made by Nestle in China Taiwanese authorities also discovered trace amounts in of melamine in Nestle's China made products and therefore in response Nestle made changes and they sent like 20 plus Swiss testers to develop a better method to detect melamine Another issue that they found they were embroiled in was the slave labor in the Thai fish market. So apparently the workers the laborers labor in Thailand mostly come from the poorer neighbors such as Myanmar, Cambodia and they are charged a huge fee that is kind of illegal. They trap by huge amounts of debt to ensure that they work in the fishing industry. Once they found out Nestle actually launched an investigation into the practices of the Thai fishing industry in 2014. and it seemed that almost all of the companies that sourced their seafood from thailand were linked to this abuse the response was to submit and so they basically promised that they would do better to be fair over here nestle found out an issue and they promised to do better to be fair now this is another issue uh, we're going to end it with this actually Oh no. There's a lot more. There are a lot more pages. Wow. Nestle you've embroiled yourself in quite a few things, huh? Deforestation in Ghana and Ivory Coast. So, this is not just for Nestle alone. A lot of the chocolate manufacturers like Nestle were found to be indirectly linked to the deforestation happening in Ivory Coast in Ghana. And this was mostly because traders routinely purchased cocoa beans that were grown illegally in protected regions so protected forests were being destroyed so that they could be converted to cocoa plantations and the companies sort of sourcing the cocoa beans the cocoa beans refused to look any further as long as they were getting the cocoa so this caused rain forest covers to be reduced drastically that's essentially at this po- uh, at 20 around 2018 it was less than 4% of ivory coast's entire landmass also in national parks had been converted to cocoa plantations in certain cases almost 90% of the national park had been converted now the traders that were doing all of this were selling beans to most chocolate producers like hershey's mars and nestle okay so obviously along with poaching because national parks were being reduced 
cover of the forest was being reduced it caused severe problems for wildlife because it aided and abetted with the poaching and it caused a huge elephant population drop it caused it to drop to actually the number of 400 they also caused severe losses to the chimp population and there was a study by mighty earth that indicated that continued demand for unethically manufactured co- chocolate would ensure that there would be no forests left by 2030 in these countries there's like 7 years left for that deadline when the guardian asked chocolate producers to comment on these issues they mentioned that they were making steps to eliminate the usage of such cacao they did not deny the usage of such cacao currently they were trying to eliminate but again this was an issue not just to do with nestle so moving on there was a price fixing scandal in Ca- in canada okay so in 2012 after nearly 5 years of investigation the competition bureau of canada filed charges against nestle hershey mars and cadbury for price fixing the allegations were that the former ceo of nestle canada robert leonides shared the pricing plans of his company with his competitors namely hershey's cadbury and mars which did the same so that they could control the market illegally the investigation began with a tip off from cadbury which also implicated the retail distributor etwal in the attempt to cause an artificial rise in the prices of chocolate in canada between 2002 and 2008 so the charges were finally dropped in 2015 but Hershey Canada actually pleaded guilty to the charges and they were fined 4 billion I mean sorry 4 million Canadian dollars and they agreed to cooperate with the investigations so actually according to the competition act in Canada it's supposed to be illegal and a criminal offense for two or more co- uh, competitors to conspire agree or arrange to fix prices allocate customers or markets or restrict the output of a particular product as reported by the Huffington Post. Interestingly, Nestle actually paid 9 million Canadian dollars to settle another separate civil class action lawsuit that alleged the same thing, price fixing in the chocolate market. Despite paying the settlement, Nestle has adamantly denied any wrongdoing. So, finally, we end with Nestle's last controversy. controversy whatever you want to pronounce it as which is the purchase of milk by from Roger Robert Mugabe so this guy Mr Robert Mugabe was the leader of Zimbabwe and he was instrumental in seizing farms owned by white people so among those farms was one particular farm called Foyle Farm whose owner was forced to sell off the property for 25% of its actual value and later it was found that he only received 40% of the sales price so not only was he cheated once he was cheated twice he so if the place was worth $100 it was valued at 25 and he didn't even get 25 he only got 40% of that which is close to 10 ish so for a $100 farm he received $10 basically he received 10% in total wow that's sad so what happened was grace the wife of mugabe took over the farm and was renamed gushungo dairy estate under her administration output dropped to 35% of its production under earlier management and also mugabe's administration saw zimbabwe's economy plunge resulting in massive hyperinflation So Nestle Zimbabwe actually continued to source milk from Mugabe's farm and this was criticized by the United States as well as the European Union as an attempt to stop the Mugabe's from land grabs and other ethical actions both authorities had placed sanctions on them but Nestle was not bound by these sanctions since it's based in Switzerland which is not part of the EU it was not obligated to it was not obligated to abide by the sanctions of the US or the EU so they made it clear that they weren't breaking any laws but the increasingly negative press coverage forced them to change their position they defended their stance saying that had nestle decided to close down operations the company would have 
triggered further food shortages and hundreds of job losses among its employees and milk suppliers in an already difficult economic situation. So that was the defense for illegally, I mean, not illegally, but using morally questionable methods of sourcing milk in Zimbabwe. So there are the facts. I'm going to have to do something better with this entire video, but there are people that have come out with better videos. There's one called Nestle's Darkest Truth, which I will link in the description, which talks about this entire situation. I was actually inspired by a bunch of videos that I saw all of this, that I saw back in 2018, and I decided to look into it. So, man, this is an issue, man, when companies come out with all of this, the relentless pursuit of profit is going to cause issues. It's sad, but this is the fact. Is it a stretch of imagination to call Nestle evil, especially after all of this? <sighs> it's difficult, isn't it? I'm going to leave off on making wide brush strokes and paint people in using br wide strokes of evil and good and all of that stuff. But yeah, Nestle is not quite the happy company that it looks like it is. So let's end the podcast with that. There's a lot of editing. I need to put out the video today itself. But thank you for joining. I will see you again next week. Ciao.